I try, to, I try to figure out. I was like, is the time come, Lord? <laughs> Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Yeah, I was thinking it was going to be brighter than that, too. Uh, you already got it, didn't you, Judy? Thank you. Okay, let's finish up Proverbs 16 tonight, and uh, I don't have any introductions or anything of that sort. Let's just dive right in. We left off with verse 15. Let's pick up with verse 16. Proverbs 16, verse 16. Now, well, okay, let's read it. How much better to get wisdom than gold? And to get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. Now, Proverbs has defined understanding for us. Does anybody remember what it is, Bible students? Understanding, what is it according to Solomon in the book of Proverbs? Knowledge of the Holy One. Knowledge of the Holy One. Understanding is knowledge of the Holy One. Wisdom and understanding sometimes are used interchangeably. But let's remember what this book is all about from the beginning uh, Solomon spent that whole first chapter telling us that the purpose for him writing this book was so that we could know wisdom. And we discovered that he was talking about the wisdom, the person, which is Holy Spirit, Ema, Mama of the family, Father, Son, Spirit, Mama of the family, Ema, the Holy Spirit, the person, wisdom, the process of wisdom, what we call that process, sanctification. The process of wisdom. The process that God, when we step into the covenant like we talked about this morning, and we committed our works to the Lord, we began this process. Sometimes it's a painful process. Sometimes it's a process that's full of joy. But we're learning as we go and we're drawing in near and our knowledge of, the, of God is growing. Our knowledge of the Holy One is growing. So that's what the purpose of this book is, is to know wisdom. The person, the process and the intelligence skill that comes with that. How many of you know that when you walk with the Lord, you get to be a little more intelligent? Uh, common sense just kind of comes about you. You don't get to talk, Mama. <laughs> okay, all right, let me say this so that Joyce can catch her breath over here from laughing. I've got a lot more sense now than I had when I got here. <laughs> she can accept that. The wisdom of the Lord. It's the person, the process, and the intelligence skill. Which uh, your dad, Charlie, and my grandpa would call that horse sense. Wisdom. Horse sense. Just, just having some sense. And, and so that, that's what happens. Kind of like a side effect of just knowing and walking faithfully with the Lord. It's what happens. And so... Solomon is telling us here in verse 16 that it's actually better than gold. Gold, most valuable thing, precious metals. Understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. And so rather than money and riches and wealth and gold and silver and precious metals, we need to know wisdom. The person, the process, and the intelligence. That's what this chapter's been about. It's been, a, it's been the little yellow brick road. We've been walking down that process step by step here. I'm hoping we continue that little process. I want to remind you of that so that we can, you can be looking for it as we go through here. Uh, so that's the most valuable thing is to know and to get wisdom, to get it. Uh, the highway of the upright, who's the upright? The upright or the justified. The upright are the people who are in relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, who are in relationship with God through the provision of the cross and through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the upright, those, those people, the people who aren't hostile to him, the people who have recovered from the acedia, from the spiritual depression, from the affliction that we looked at a while back, the highway of the upright is to depart from evil 
And he who keeps his way preserves his soul. We talked about the fear of the Lord this morning. That's what delivers us from death below and from sin and from wickedness. And so the highway of the upright is to depart from evil. It's the way. 15, chapter 15, verse 24 says the way of life. It winds upward for the wise that he may turn away from hell below. We talked about it that night, that it's the way that winds upward. We just got to stay on the way. You're going to run into that again in a minute in one of these verses here. Keep that thought in mind that it's the way that winds upwards from hell below. We just got to stay on the way. Jesus said, I'm the way. Right? Uh, verse 18 now, the contrast to that is, now verse 17 said, The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He who keeps his way preserves his soul. But now 18, contrast to that, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Uh, therefore, to be, verse 19, to better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Anybody ever... Does that sound familiar? Does that strike a familiar chord? You ever been in the, in the wealth of the world with those who seem powerful? It just, I have. I have. I've, I've had plenty of cash and no satisfaction and no fulfillment. I've had power and upstanding in the eyes of the drug world, you know, where, you know, I had the dope, so they came to me, and so I had some power. But it quickly crumbled out from under me. I'm not trying to make this about me. I'm just trying to see what, let you see what comes to my mind when we talk about these things. It's better to uh, be of a humble spirit with the lowly than it is to divide the spoil with the proud. And so he who heeds the word wisely will find good. And whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. That's blessed. Happy is he. What are we describing here on the good side of this? The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. And he who preserves his, he who keeps his way preserves his soul. What, what's happened here in the context of this chapter? We're talking about people who've made the preparations of the heart. Who have stopped being so hostile to God. Who have made the choice to believe and entered into the covenant relationship with the Lord. And they're on the way that winds upward to depart from hell below. That's what we're talking about here. The upright. The people who have said, okay, I'm going to quit resisting. Anybody ever watch Cops? You ever think they, get them, they, get them, they chase them down. They get them. They're trying to get them cuffed. And what are they always saying? Stop resisting. I think that that's what the Lord was saying to me for years is stop resisting. Stop resisting. You know, I've got, I mean, he said it in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. He said, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. And they're for good and not for evil. For a hope and for a future. But we don't really believe that, do we? I'd like to think that it was unnecessary for the consequences to become as severe as they did to get my attention to cause me to believe. But sometimes it's just that way. Sometimes it's just that way. Charlie, you're going to run into that with you minister down here. You're going to run into some folks that are just resistant. He who heeds the word wisely, verse 20, will find good. Jesus said, there's none good but God alone. But if you heed the word wisely, if we rightly divide this, and if we uh, uh, keep a humble spirit, we'll find good. Jeremiah 29, 13, the Lord said through Jeremiah, if my people will seek me with all their heart, they will find me. Do we believe that? You know this isn't an external exchange. This is an internal exchange. Do you know that, that you can make it all look good on the outside. And not really give your heart to the Lord. I did it for years. I, but you know old con man. 
pull old hustle job off and try to make it all look good on the outside, but inside, that's not going to work. If you're going to learn from any of the mistakes I made, it's better to be humble in spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the rich or with the great or whatever it was that it said. He who heeds the word wisely will find good, and whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he, he's blessed. The wise in heart will be called prudent, verse 21, and sweetness of the lips increases learning. Now, we're not, that's, that's not talking about that. Be nice. It's talking more about the content of what we're saying than it is with the manner in which we say it. Now, look, I'm not saying that I'm right and that you should be rude and abrasive. I'm not saying that. The Lord's got that to tackle with me, and I know that. But the sweetness of the lips that it's talking about has got more to do with content and character than it does with being flattering and nice. I, I believe that a Christian uh, should, at some point, uh, become a lot nicer person. And that's a process because we don't let go of the flesh real easy. But I think that there's a lot of people who are saying... Christians are supposed to be nice, so you need to be nice. And I think they're just being nice. And if being nice is all you got, you got nothing. If you don't have any character and integrity, if you don't have any Jesus in your heart, if you don't have any of the word, if you don't have the truth, if your love is not anchored in truth, it's false. But it needs to be a genuine kind heart. And it needs to be of content and character more than just a flattering tone. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying that we don't need to be kind and we don't need to be nice because we do. But it needs to come from truth. It needs to come from relationship. Speak it up. Speak it up. Yes. And it's Seasoned with grace. We need to be more concerned about people's soul than we do their feelings. If it wasn't for the truth offending me on a regular basis for about 18 months, it wouldn't have brought me into the place of relationship that I enjoy that spares me and saves me every day. Now, truth. Sometimes it wasn't what I wanted to hear, but it was that I had men and women in my life that cared more about my soul than they did my feelings. And that's who we need to be in Christ. <clears throat> okay, uh, well, I got another verse to get. Verse 22. Understanding, that's knowledge of the Holy One, right? Is a wellspring of life to him who has it. But the correction of fools is folly. And that's a little misleading. That's not saying that it is folly to correct a fool. It's saying that the correction that's from fools is folly. You see what I'm saying? You be careful who you trust in for your counsel, right? So understanding, that's knowledge of the Holy One. That's a wellspring of life to him who has it. Contrast that with the understanding of the fool. Who's the fool? The fool, according to Psalms 14, is the person who has said in his heart, there is no God. And so all of his counsel is folly and foolishness, and it'll lead you astray. Now, we're building up to a thing here that we're going to finish this chapter up with. We're talking about the talk and the deception 
and the deceptive ways of people. So we're building up to it, okay? And so understanding, knowledge of the Holy One is a wellspring of life to him who has it, but the correction from fools is folly. You want to stay away from that. The heart, this is the part I laughed about, verse 23. The heart, the mind, will, and emotions, the center of the animation that motivates and moves around this earth suit, the heart of the wise... Teaches his mouth. <laughs> Some of y'all slow to learn. <laughs> y'all. Some of y'all. Some of us are we're slow to learn, aren't we? <clears throat> when we commit our works to the Lord. And when we walk faithfully with Jesus, and when we submit to the word of truth, there is a change that happens on the inside that doesn't manifest itself outwardly immediately. And then, while we're entering into that covenant relationship, and we've still got that spirit of flesh, that mind, will, and emotions that's been affected by sin and wickedness and the apostasy and the acedia and the indifference and the apathy and the pride and the haughtiness and the, all that stuff. It's all these effects, you see. But we're used to hearing this voice. And the Spirit of the Lord moves in here. And it takes a lifetime of daily involvement, of daily submission to get to where we give his voice more prominence than we do this more familiar voice. And so I, I, I think that we are a people looking for a magic bullet when actually this is a lifelong process. And we don't need to get too hasty with our progress or anything because this takes time. And the Lord won't put more on us than what we can handle. And he's gently bringing us along. That's why it takes commitment and submission is because this is a day-by-day -day thing. <clears throat> Pleasant words. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't finish that, did I? Verse 23. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds learning to his lips. That conversion on the inside, it teaches our mouth. The pleasant words, uh, pleasant words are, are like a honeycomb. Sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. There's a way. Now, I want you to notice that there's some italicized words here. And when they, you see these italicized words, that means that they weren't part of the original text. And so we're going to read it both ways. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That I would take the italicized words out. There is a way right to a man. There's a way that's right to a man, but its end the way of death. You can, uh, we've done this before. You can accent different parts of that sentence and understand it from a lot of different angles. There's, there's, a, there's a way that, that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way. You see what I'm saying? You can do that for yourself. Verse 26 the person who labors, labors for himself. For his hungry mouth drives him on. Uh, I don't have any revelation about that verse. But, but I, I, I think that if you understand biblical principles, like God said in the Old Testament, that if a man won't work, he shouldn't eat. Things like that. I, I think that God gives us that hunger. Uh, that hunger to cooperate with him, that hunger to get out here and do what's right, to make an honest living, to, you know, it's, it's a lot of day. I don't want to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and take off on that truck, do you? 
I, I don't like getting up in the middle of the dark like that and have to do this stuff. But you know what? There's something that drives me. What is it? Well, it's this hungry mouth. Because the, the Lord has covered me, he's taken care of me, and he's really blessed my life and everything like that. But you know what? If I don't get up and go to work, guess what? When that gut goes to growling, there ain't nobody to fall back on. My bills don't get paid if I don't do it. I think that's just the Lord's sense of what's right. Get up and go to work. Get up and go to work. You know? And, and I, I can appreciate that. He worked on my work ethic a whole lot. The hungry is italicized, so the person who labors, labors for himself, for his mouth drives him. His mouth drives him. That mouth wants to eat. <laughs> Verse 27. An ungodly man digs up evil. He searches for it. He scrounges or he hunts for it like treasure. Looking for evil. Looking for wickedness. Looking for self-centeredness. He's looking for support this agenda of his own. He digs for it like it was treasure. Right? And it's on his lips like a burning fire. A perverse man sows strife and a whisperer separates the best of friends. You see the context that's being set up here? We're talking about the talking and the whispering and the ungodly digging up evil. It's on his lips like a burning fire. Now catch, check out verse 29. Verse 29, a violent man entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that's not good. I had to go to look, look up the Hebrew word there. What's meaning? You know what the Hebrew word for violent is? Hamas. I was like, well, that pricked my curiosity when I found that out. So we're talking about violence, right? But that don't fit the context, does it? Because we're not talking about violence here. We're not talking about an aggressive man, a violent man. A... We're not talking about that. Okay, so Hamas is a Hebrew word, and it means violence or injustice by lying. Context, context, context. We got, we've got. The, we've got the, the ungodly man digging up evil and it's on his lips like a burning fire, burning people down with it. We've got a perverse man, a crooked man who's sowing strife, right? We've got a whisper that's separating friends. We've got a, a person in here that's just trying to cause division and strife and to upset the peace that's in the body. We got that guy. And then we go right to this violent man. Well, he's a violent man because of the lies and the injustice that he's telling out of his mouth. Okay? And he's separating friends. He's dividing the body. He's creating division. We're more divided in this nation right now than I've ever seen in my lifetime. And we're liable to again. She said, last time it was this divided, we had a civil war. And we're liable to again. We're very liable to again. But what I'm saying is, is that there is just like in our prayer before the worship service, there is a solution to this, and his name is Jesus. If my people will humble themselves and come before me and pray, I'll heal their land. God is itching to bless his people. But there's a great division being made right now. The sheep are being divided from the goats. Are you, you can almost hear God saying, are you my people? Because I want to see it in your heart. I want to see it on the inside. I want to see you devoted to me. I want to see you loving me. We know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who Who, those who love him and are called according to his purpose. What was his purpose? We looked at it this morning. 
from before the foundations of the world, the redemption of mankind to reconcile the human soul with the Spirit of God so that there could be relationship and family. God is itching to bless His people, to pour out blessing from the windows of heaven that we can't contain. But it's going to require the hearts of God's people getting serious about their allegiance and their commitment to this marriage relationship with him and we need to heed here I'm saying we need to heed here Alan Jackson says the, con- the problems that we're facing in this nation right now have little to do with the depravity of the wicked but if we want a better outcome it's going to depend on the heart of God's people I think that's a worthwhile statement We've coasted for a long time here. It's time for God's people to stand up for the gospel, for the name of Jesus, for the, for the plan of redemption because the curtain on time and history is going to close here soon. I don't know how soon. And if I get egg on my face for saying that, I don't care. I'll be a fool for Jesus every day. But I believe the word. And it says. <laughs> that when people. Are haters of God and lovers of themselves and lovers of money. And when lawlessness abounds so that the love of many grow cold. That your redemption draws near. The injustice created by the troublemaking guy entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that's not good. He winks his eye to devise perverse things. He purses his lips and brings about evil. Pursing his lips means that he's he's doing this over here. He's... He said, winking across the room when the guys are sitting up here, the people are doing this, and they got guys stationed around the room. It's like at a card game or whatever, and they're going to cheat this guy. They're going to rob this guy, and he's winking with his shuffling his feet. We've seen this before in Proverbs. Perverse and crooked people, they're taking advantage of innocent people. That's what we're talking about here. The world's full of it. I wanted to apply that pursing of the lips to a politician, but that's not pursing words, that's parsing words that politicians do. I got that off NCIS if you was wondering. Uh, Leon was in the cafe eating one day and the politician came up and said, said, how you doing or something like that? And Leon said something pretty, you know, pretty eloquent or whatever like that. And he said, parsing words like a real pu- public servant. And that's when I read that, that's what I thought about, but that's not the same thing. <laughs> This guy's taking advantage of people that are unaware. We see it more and more in the news every day. The the woman got kidnapped down in Memphis and the other one put her and the kid in the car and took them to the ATM machine, made them get money out. The guy was flying the airplane, threatening to crash it into the Walmart. Just evil, just wickedness. So do we pack up the guns and the knives and we go down and we show them who's the boss? Well, that's worldly thinking. We lean into Jesus. We solidify the commitment. I'm not talking about external things. I'm talking about right here. Solidify our devotion. And our allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ in this relationship. We need to work on that every day of our lives because it's a worthwhile pursuit. You think that these hideous things that we're talking about, these people here, we think you think that these things are just ridiculous. But let me remind you. That every one of us 
if we drift off away from Jesus, are capable of anything that anybody else does. He is the solution. Because I'm going to tell you, I, I took a lot of pride in my 40-something uh, years as a drug addict that I never used a needle. Before I came to the Lord, I did. Circumstances changed. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. I got a little more desperate. I got just a little more needy for some sort of satisfaction that I couldn't find. And I did it. Now, I don't have that boasting right anymore. I don't have that prideful stance. And I think about that when I think about these things that I'm talking to you about. I think about, you let the circumstances change just a little bit. And you rationalize your way into accepting something that you never would have done in your life. We need the Lord. Because it's the conversion that he makes in this mind will and emotions on the inside of us that makes the difference between us and this man. We need to humble ourselves and be humble before the Lord. We need to devote ourselves to Him. We need to make sure that we are. Gary, this is about you. Verse 31. The silver-haired head is a crown of glory. That's, that, that's Gary Brown all day long right there. Crown of glory on his head. Ron, you're out of the game on that. <laughs> it's found. <laughs> it's found in the way of righteousness. In the way of Jesus. In the way of faith and belief. In the way of relationship, in the way of commitment, in the way of submission, in the way of the fear of the Lord. It's where this is found. He who is, let's skip that verse. <laughs> Y'all, we, we don't need to expound on this, do we? He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. The word for spirit here is the same one that we looked at this morning. It's ruah. It's breath. It's the breath that motivates our action. It, 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 it is, it, it, we're talking about, it's, if you look at Psalm 1815, it's referring to God here. Uh, and it says, I'll just read a few verses of it. We got a little extra time. <clears throat> Let's just read Psalm 18. Uh, For the choir director, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I'm saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me in the torrents of ungodliness. Some of that stuff we've been talking about here. They terrified me. The cords of Sheol, that's the grave, surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and I cried to my God for help. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry for help before him came into my ears. Then the earth shook and quaked and the foundations of the mountains were trembling and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up out of his nostrils and a fire from his mouth devoured. A coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with thick darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew. And he sped upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his hiding place. His canopy around him. Darkness of waters. Thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness 
Before him passed his thick clouds, hailstones, and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered them, and lightning flashes in abundance, and he routed them. Then the channels of water appeared, and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of of the Ruah, of the Spirit. That's what we're talking about. Of your nostrils. So we're talking about anger. And it's not always a bad thing. But we're talking about he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty that rules me out. And he who rules his breath. That angry breath. Than he who takes a mighty city. Do you understand what he's saying here? He's saying that you and me, we need the grace and the presence of the Lord because. We would easier take a city with fortified walls and a military compost set up to protect it than we can control our own anger. You hear that? Easier to single handedly take a military enforced city with walls than to control. Our own breath. I'll read it again. Better. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his ruah. Than he who takes a city. This isn't, enti this isn't intended to beat anybody down. Because I'd be the first one to fall. This is a cry, a call. This is a quickening for the people of God to realize how easily it is to use the power of our words to destroy. We need to be aware of that. And that should solidify the commitment of our works to Jehovah so that he can put his love and his grace and his kindness in us because there's guys like me out here that aren't good at pretending we need the Lord because we're a wicked bunch just because we Got some faithful attendance and put the money in the basket and do the things doesn't mean that we need the Lord. We need to come in. I don't know about you, but I, I, I can only speak for myself, but I'm one of these guys that matches emotions. You get mad at me, I get right back mad back. You see the same news that I see and hear. Wickedness, violence, and aggression is on the rise. I need the Lord, and I need His wisdom, and I need to know Him. If I'm going to stick to my allegiance to Him, if I'm going to believe upon His grace and His mercy, surrounded by evil and violence, it's a hard thing to pull apart from matching those emotions. Because we're tick for tack. Like Sean Connery. Don't bring a knife to a gunfight. You put one of ours in the hospital and put one of yours in the morgue. That's the Chicago way. That's who we are. If we drift away from Jesus. Do 
the lot is cast into the lap. Now, that's the lot of men that's given by God. Like you've heard people say, my lot in life. This is my lot in life. Serving this church, this is my lot in life. That's not what my lot in life was before because I determined my own lot in life. But when I came here, when I entered into the covenant, when I committed my works to the Lord, he gave me, he cast his lot into my lap, and I'm pursuing that now. And that's what we're talking about. So the lot is cast into the lap. But it's every decision, the one who determines the outcome of how I use these gifts and these talents and these advantages and these opportunities that he's given me. Well, that's up to him, and he's going to determine how that goes. How many of you know that you can cooperate with the Lord and make this path a whole lot easier? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the wisdom that's available to us in Proverbs. Thank you, Lord, for your truth that reminds us of who we are both with and without you. Lord, we need your Holy Spirit in us, Lord. We need your grace. We need your mercy. We need your tenderness and your kindness. We need to have the tender mercies that... Paul talked about in Colossians chapter 3, Lord. We need those. But they need to be genuine because flattery don't cut it. We need to be truth bearers. We need to be your witness. Just like with the 12, you told them, don't leave Jerusalem. Don't go anywhere. But when the Spirit comes upon you, you'll have power and you will be my witnesses. We want that, Lord. We need that and we want that because we love you, Lord, and we want to please you. We want to be a blessing to you, not a disgrace. Go with us this week, Lord, and help us. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.